those who will hear it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have um, Pastor Shayi Thomas there. He's my dear friend. Amen. He's fellowshipping with us. You're welcome. Amen. He's one of our senior pastors in Nigeria, but of course, I've known Shayi for, what, 35 years or more. Amen. I've known him since college. Amen. He used to be very rascally, but he said, He's saved and sanctified. <laughs> he said, we are both, and we are both, but we are both saved now, sorry. <laughs> He's my good friend. <laughs> I want to share with us about living your dreams. Living your dreams. And of course, when we talk about dreams, the classic example that we have is the story of Joseph. Because he's the dreamer that we know of. And Joseph, I believe most of us will know the story, but I will try as much as possible to say a little bit of it because a lot of times now we always assume people know these stories, but we found out that maybe people don't know these stories. So, but if you don't know it, you will know it today. And if you know it before, you will know it better. All right, Joseph was, was one of 12 boys that was born to this man called Jacob. And he was loved greatly by his father. His father loved him. Of course, the Bible says that he loved him because he was a child of his old age. But uh, there is more to that. Why? Because he wasn't the only child of his old age. Joseph still had a brother called Benjamin, who was younger. So. But really, his father loved him greatly. And his father showed everybody that he loves him. But the truth is that we also have God as our own father who has shown us that he loves us. Joseph's father showed him, as we'll find out, that he loved him by giving him a coat of many colors. But God shows us that he loves us, that he gave us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In actual fact, the Bible says that he demonstrated his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. His father demonstrated how much he loved him by giving him a coat of many colors. The Lord shows us how he loves us by continuously forgiving us our sins. And the love that his father had for him, and I'm going somewhere today, you have no idea where I'm going. The love that his father loved him brought hatred for him. His brothers hated him because of the father's love. But the love God has for us also, it attracts anger in the kingdom of darkness against us. And it's understandable. Just God not giving us what we deserve because of our lifestyle is an anger to the devil. And it's understandable because we sin every day, but he forgives us. But then the devil himself, he even thought about the sin. And he lost heaven. But yet we sin all the time. He forgives us. And he gives us heaven to inherit. It's enough for the devil just to be angry against us. The Bible says in the book of John, it says, what manner of love is this that the Father has bestowed upon us that people like us can be called the children of God? He said, it's on, it's, 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 it lacks understanding why God will love us in this way. And so, the brothers of Joseph, they hated him. Can, the kingdom of darkness cannot understand why God is slow to hunger. Just God forgiving us continuously and giving us eternal life. Let's look at Genesis 37. Verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably with him. I don't know whether you found some people who cannot speak peaceably with you. They are always finding fault in anything you do. When the hand of God is upon you, people will start to find fault with you. You will attract envy. People are just going to be envious of you. The Bible says in the next thing, go to verse 5. 
Now, Joseph, uh, sorry, go to verse, verse 3. Sorry, verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age. And also, he made him a tonic, or another translation says a coat of many colors. What is your own coat of many colors that God has given to you? For some of us, our coat of many colors is just our good looks. You didn't put your face together, you know. We, is it not amazing we all have two eyes, a nose at least with two nose creases, hopefully, and a mouth. But that's all we have in our face. But some people just look better than the other people. And people are hungry at you for a face you didn't put together because you are good looking. Some people, it's your intelligence that is your coat of many colors. Something that, coat of many colors just means something that makes you proud, that makes you feel fulfilled that makes you know that God loves you to have given you this. That's what the coat of many colors is, is to all of us. For some of us, we just have a nice attitude. That's our coat of many colors. Something that is just a gift that God has given to you. For some of us, our coat of many colors is our service to God. For some of us, it's material things, like it's a material thing that his father gave to him. Maybe it's your car, the precious metal that you drive. Maybe that's your own coat of many colors. You just feel cool when you're driving it. For some of us, it's our house, the kind of house God has given to us. So for some of us, our coat of many colors is that we just know how to dress well. And so every time we show up, people have to agree that this is a well-dressed person. At times, you don't understand why they are angry at you. Because for you, these are things that God blessed you with that you can't really explain how he did it. One thing they don't know is that all of these things doesn't really matter to you because it's God's gift upon your life, as we will see in the story of Joseph. Because when the opportunity came for Joseph and he became the prime minister, their hunger towards him, he didn't reiterate for them. Verse 5. Joseph now started having dreams. <laughs> Look at what he said. Joseph had a dream, and when he had told this to his brother, they hated him all the more. Verse 6. Verse 6, please continue. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. Continue, please. We were binding sheaves of grain out of the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Continue. And his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And that's important. Will you rule over us? Will you do this over us? And go, go on. And then he had another dream. And he told it to his brother. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And so, by his dreams, they hated him. The Bible says they hated him the more. This is a person who they didn't like before. Now, he started saying that his brothers were going to serve him. I'm going somewhere. Please follow me. The dream shows that he, he was going to be an honorable person. Or there is an honorable call upon his life. This dream shows that he would occupy a position of authority over every one of them. This dream shows that his family will bow down for him and that he will be greater than them. These were dreams God showed him, just like you and me. These are visions that God showed to him. God showed him his future because that's what makes God to be called the Alpha and the Omega, the ones that sees the end from the beginning. God doesn't show us what we can become for fun of it. God does not dangle carrot before us. You know how you ride a donkey and then you have a carrot because you want the donkey to move. No, that's, God doesn't do that for us. Whatever God shows to us is what he knows he can let us accomplish. That's why we talk about maximizing potentials in him. He has wired you. He's a manufacturer. He has put that potential for you to achieve that which he has shown you. And so your dreams and the visions God has given you that comes from him, no man can stop it. It shows us the potential inside of us. In every kid, there is a king. 
It might look like nobody today, but there is a king inside of that king. The tax ahead of him was huge. So was the price of it. The size of what God showed him is, was huge. And so was the price of it. The cost of it is going to be very high. You know, there's a saying where I come from. They say the bigger the head, the bigger the headache. And so what God showed him was very great. God showed him he was going to be like a king. How do I know that? Because it's only a king that the parents will be bowing down for. Listen to the next thing. They were living in Canaan. And in Canaan, there is no king. They were living in a place where there was no king. And then God showed him that he was going to be in an authority where his parents would bow down for him unless he's a king. Many of us, God has shown us many things that we can become. But it doesn't add up. He has shown us what we can become. But when you look at it, it does not add up. Let's look at this man called Joseph. He's from a dysfunctional family. Like some of us are from dysfunctional family. I'm from a dysfunctional family. Not badly dysfunctional, but I, I, my, my mom was the wife that never lived with my dad. So I was a child that was born outside of wedlock. And so when you look at this boy, boy too, completely dysfunctional. The father had two wives who had children for him and two housemaids who had children for him. How, how else can he be more dysfunctional? So, but with a person like this, God showed him that he was going to be in a position that is honorable, that he was going to be in a position of authority. It doesn't add up. Like many of us, when we look at our lives, we look at our background, our pedigree, and so many other things, it doesn't add up for what God has shown to us. We say, I don't have all of this. How will I be able to achieve this? The background, I don't even want to, anybody to know my background. The other thing is resources. When God shows you what you can do and what you can achieve, you look at the resources you have. You lack a whole lot of things. You lack money. You are struggling. You are just eking out of life. The right education you don't have. And then God is saying you are getting to the position of authority. God is speaking to some of us. We are looking behind. Whether he's speaking to somebody behind. No, he's talking to you. You know, somebody say, hey, excuse me. Then you're saying, me? Yeah, you. You're the one is saying, the greatness lie ahead of you. Yeah. I say greatness lie ahead of you. Yeah. The education might not hard up. Because let me tell you this. If it hearts up, you don't need God. Because how can the glory be his if you can do it by yourself? Testimony is a product of a test. That's it. The test you go through, the greater the test, the greater the testimony. That's what it is. God is saying you will be a joyful mother. But you're saying, but I'm not even married at my age. How can I be? How can this thing be? You will not be the first one who have said that. Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus, said so. He said, how can this thing be? When I know no man. But what God has said will always come to pass. God showed you the kind of house you are going to leave. He said, but it doesn't add up. I'm even struggling to pay my rent now. God is telling you that you will drive this kind of car or whatever your desire is. It shows you this thing, but when you look at where you are now, it does not add up. He said, you'll be a CEO of an organization. He said, but I've just been laid off. How can that be? I can hardly hold the job. How can that be? I like this passage in 2 Kings chapter 3. I like this passage a lot. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. It always comes to my mind. Anytime it doesn't add up for me. This, you know, the background of this is that these three kings gathered together and they were going to go to war. But along the way, they had animals and all of those things. They ran out of resources. And so one of them said, wait a minute. Is there no prophet that we can go and talk to? Who can solve this problem for us? Because the man saw that the problem that they had was a spiritual problem. A lot of times we look at the problems carnally, but you can never solve a spiritual problem in a carnal way. It, never, it will never work. You will just be there going around in circle. Because once it's a spiritual problem, you've got to solve it spiritually. So, um, 
2 Kings chapter 3. Let's look at what happened here. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Then he said, this is the prophet Elisha. He said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. You know, what he's saying is that make holes. Yeah, make different holes all over the place. That's what he's saying. Make holes. It's like getting big, big, big bowls. Provide big bowls. And listen to what he says. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, because when it's going to rain, there is a wind that heralds the rain to come. So, but he says you will not see the rain, you will not see the wind. Because what you expect and how you expect it to be, it won't happen like that. Because we give up. Somebody says so it's going to be a rain. Then you expect that, of course, the wind will first blow, and then clouds will gather. He says none of those things will happen. But what do you want? Water. But you will still get the water. The Bible says that he that, that observe the wind will not sow. Because there is a way you observe the wind. And you expect that the wind, you need to see the wind before you sow or you take the move or you, make, or you take that step of faith. But here he says, you shall not see the wind, nor shall you see the rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water so that your cattle and your animals may drink. What do, you, what do you want the rain for? Your cattle and your animals to have water. He says, you will get the final result, yet you will not add up for the final result you expected, but you will get the final result. A lot of the times we look at what we have, it doesn't add up. So when it doesn't add up, what do we do? We give up. Let me tell you this, no one can stop the dream and the visions God has given to you. The devil cannot stop it, but you can stop it because you can give up upon it. I'm going somewhere today. What kills our dream is what we don't have. It's not what we don't have. What kills our dream is not what it takes to do it. What kills it is us. But God gave you dreams. But God who gave you dreams will make it happen. In the mighty name of Jesus. That is if you have faith in him. Let's move on. Joseph did some things to fulfill his dreams. I would be able to take four of these and then we will continue. I'm sharing it today on part one of this message, living your dreams. Let's look at this man. What are the things that he did that he still fulfilled his dream? Let's go back to Genesis 37. We are starting. And Israel, Israel is also called Jacob, said to Joseph, that is his father, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, what did he say to him, please? Can we all read that out? This, the first point is that he was serving before his dream came to pass. He was serving. God showed him what his what his future was going to be. God gave him a vision, gave him a dream. One of the dreams, the interesting thing, you know, like I said in the first two slides, the Bible is very interesting. I've preached this Genesis 37, I don't know how many times. But I was just studying to preach this one again, and I've never noticed this statement. Here I am. Never did. I'm telling you. It just tells us since there is no new Bible, there must be new revelation. Look at this boy. God showed him that he was going <laughs> to rule over these boys. That's what God showed him. But then his father was going to send him to serve the ones God showed him he was going to rule. He tells us the kind of person Joseph is. If some of us say, no, no, I'm not going to her. Those people, God has shown me that I'm their leader. Why would I go and serve them? No, I'm not going to do that. That's how many people have walked away from what God has shown them. Because this in going was in the plan. And so what we need to do is to continue to serve. He was ready to be of service to his brother. Look at the story. Let's look at it. I will send you to them. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers. And brothers and well with the flocks. And bring back a word. So he sent him out to the valley of Hebron. And he went to Shechem. Look at this. It's just interesting. I've never seen this thing before. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wondering. You know, wondering is different from wondering of thinking. 
wandry that is just going around in circle, aimlessly, not sure of where he was going. He was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? It wasn't the man, one that went to the man. Because at times you are wondering, you don't even know you're wondering. But God sends help to you. Listen, go on. So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flock. And the man said, they have departed from here. <laughs> For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brother and found them in Dothan. He set out to go to Shechem. He found out that they were not in Shechem, but he did not give up. He was ready to go an extra mile. Many of us will say, you know, in Shechem, oh, since they are not here, I'm going back home. He will have missed him being sold into slavery. He will have missed the destiny of his life. How many times do we miss things in life? That's why I say the only person who can stop your destiny is you. Because he got there, he didn't find them there. There are times when we serve and we don't get the result of our service and we say we're no more serving. After all, I tried. It just didn't work out. No, no, no. You never get weary in doing the right thing. Look at this man's attitude. He was serving before his dream came to pass. Are you serving? What God has shown you, you continue to serve until the dream comes to pass. The Bible says he was wondering. At times we are wondering in our service. We don't even know what we're doing, but we keep doing the thing. <clears throat> At times in the service, we look lost. We don't even understand. It seems we are going around in circles. But God always sends help to those who serve. He will always sort them out down the line. And one thing about this is that he was willing to learn. He was also willing to get direction. Don't serve blindly without getting direction. You need guidance in your service because God will send people to you so that every step of the faith for you to accomplish that which he was, that which he has for you. The second point is that you might be betrayed by loved ones. <laughs> you might be betrayed by friends, associates, family members, people who you trust. But with the right attitude and not complaining or hugging, but with faith in the one who gave you that dream, you will always overcome. Thank you. L let's look at this story. Let's go on. <laughs> That's it. We'll continue to read. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. You, they can gather together. It does not mean that they will be able to achieve it. It doesn't matter. Their gathering is not the issue. It is God who gave you the dream that will make it to come to pass. You just need the right attitude for it. They said to one another, look, the dreamer is coming. They did not know that what they were saying was prophesying to him. From their mouth to God. They said, here comes the dreamer. That's what they said. Come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into the pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Continue, please. But Reuben, everybody say but Reuben. Because you know what? God will always send a Reuben. Who will speak on your behalf? God will always send a Reuben that will fight for you. God will send a Reuben that will support you. He, you know, he wasn't even aware of the conversation. Do you know how many times that they are plotting and saying things about you that you are not even aware of? But I said God will always send a Reuben. Look at what Reuben, Reuben had it and, 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 and had it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into the pit, which is in the wilderness. It's interesting that they will put him in the pit. You saw yourself in position of honor. Now you are looking at yourself in the pit. You know, it, it, the way God moves the time is, is mysterious and it's a wonder to perform. You know, he did not even leave him on ground zero. God took him lower 
than it used to be. It's amazing how God works. When you are in the pit, it's a place that is lonely. It's a place of loneliness and frustration. It is a place where you will say, did I hear well? Am I sure that God spoke to me? Won't these dreams come to pass? They will come to pass because everything was working towards one goal of achieving those dreams and the visions that God has shown him. Go on to the next verse. Verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brother, they stripped him <laughs> of his tonic. The tonic of many colors that was on him. You know, they, they used this word that they stripped him. The next thing I want to talk about is that, number three, Joseph didn't have attachment to things. Number three, he didn't have attachment to things. Here the Bible says they stripped him. That is, they forcefully removed his coat and his tonic. They forcefully removed it. But you could see that he did not complain. And when people complain, the Bible always records it if it's of any help for us. Because don't forget, David had the same problem with his brothers. And they said, what are you doing in this place? In the, when they went to battle with Goliath, he had to tell them, is there another cause? What's, the, what's your problem? When they were trying to run him there. Here, the Bible did not record for us that Joseph said anything. He was an 18-year-old boy. He was a teenager. If he was a teenager, they said, oh, leave me here. What's it now? I'm going to report all of you. What's wrong? The Bible said, they did not say anything. And don't forget, he used to report them before. That means he was a talkative. But he didn't say anything. Because he doesn't have an attachment. I believe that what Joseph was thinking, don't forget what I'm about to say, that you can take my coat, but you can't take my dreams. You can take my coat, it doesn't matter. My dreams are within me. You can do whatever you want against me. It's not going to do anything. It didn't have attachment to anything. Why do I say that? If you look at Genesis 39, verse 12, we'll come back to Genesis uh, uh, 37. Look at Genesis 39, verse 12. This was in the house of Potiphar. Look at what happened. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand. <laughs> it doesn't have attachment to anything. The first one, they stripped him and took the garment forcefully. The second time with the issue of the garment, he voluntarily left that garment. The first one, they took it forcefully. The second one, he left it. So a lot of times, there are things that we think are important. But later on, we find out that really, they are not anything. That all these things that you are belly aching upon is nothing. I want to say to you, don't have attachment to anything that you can't give up for your dreams and for God. Don't have attachment to anything. Don't have attachment to anger. Don't have attachment to unforgiveness. Don't have attachment to anything. You know, there are some people, they say, ah, all right. You will know today that ah, don't make any point to anybody. Have attachment to nothing. No matter how precious the thing is, there must be nothing that, you, that can be more important than your dreams and your relationship with God. Have attachment to nothing. And you could see, they stripped him. The other one, he gave it up voluntarily. Number four, a setback doesn't end your dreams. A setback does not end your dreams. They sold him into slavery, but he became the head in Potiphar's house, and he controlled everything. Because at times we always feel that this setback, that's it. No, 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 no. Let's look at Genesis 39, verse 8. Genesis 39, verse 8. Look at what he said. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand, though he was a slave. But he was still in charge of the house. I'm sure uh, this Potiphar was a military guy. He has uh, bodyguards. He has other people, generals and all of those people around him. But he committed his house into Joseph's hand. 
if you read Genesis 39, verse 22, look at that also. Genesis 39, verse 22. Now he went into prison. Let's see what happened to him in prison. The truth of the matter is that if the hand of God is upon your life, wherever you are, you will be fruitful. Even if they put you in the desert, you will create an oasis in the place that is dry. Look at verse 22. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. He himself was a prisoner. But they committed all the other prisoners to him. It was and sorry, it was his doing. That is, everything that was going on in the prison, he was in charge of it. So a setback does not end your dreams. So one thing I, 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 I conjecture out of this is that you can prosper in the midst of adversity. In the midst of adversity. If the hand of God is upon you, because it's a setback for a comeback. You must never forget that. It's a setback for a comeback. You know, I say this all the time. Those of us who grew up in, uh, in Africa, we see this all the time. You know, during Christmas festivi festivity or Muslim uh, 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 programs and all of those things, they, 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 we buy rams. You understand? Rams. You know, and uh, during those period, those people who buy rams, family, they will come to a place and they will use those rams to fight. But if you've never seen the ram fight before, you would think the ram is afraid because the ram always what? Backs up. But the backing up is not out of fear. The backing up is to go and gather momentum. There are many of you feel it's a setback, but all you are doing is you are gathering what? Momentum. Because when that ram charges forward, whatever that head beats is called a breakthrough. So the reason why you backed up is for a momentum that at your coming, Whatever your head eats is a breakthrough for you. You will receive breakthrough. I say you will receive breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. A setback for a comeback. That's what it is for you. It's not the end of the situation. And so you can prosper in the midst of adversity. But one thing I see with this guy, and conjecturing this, is that he must have a right attitude. Not the right attitude alone. He must be diligent. For a military man who is always straight, to commit his house into the hands of a foreigner and a slave and a servant, the guy must be diligent. Not only will he, will he be diligent alone, he must be hard working. For the prison, they committed the work into his hand. He must be hard working. Most of all, he must be trustworthy. In achieving your dreams, can this be said about you? Is your attitude right? Can this be said about you? Are you diligent or slothful? Can this be said about you that you're a hard-working person and that you're trustworthy? Your word is your bond. Can that be said at all? We'll continue the other points, but let me end with this. Let's go back to Genesis 37. Where are we stop in Genesis 37? So they took Joseph's tonic, killed the kid, and the goats. Or kill the kid of the goats and dip the tonic in the blood. Go on. Let's, we're going to read today. Then they sent the tonic of many colors and they brought it to their father. And this is what they said. We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tonic or not? This is a coat of many colors. You don't have so many of it. It was specially made and put together. So asking him that stupid question. They knew. But it's okay. Verse 33. And he recognized it and said, you know, we, like I said, <laughs> we don't have time because what, this one is a whole sermon, this next thing. It is my son's tonic, a wild beast has devoured him. <laughs> Without doubt, Joseph is torn into pieces. That's a whole sermon, trust me. Why did the father say what he said? Why did he say such a thing? You didn't, you just saw the coat. <laughs> That's all you saw. You didn't really see the real masquerade. That's all you saw. You just saw that one. The palm front does not, it's not the, the palm front is not the masquerade. Why did he say that? I wasn't there, but I can think. 
that the first thing is that it is not uncommon that wild beasts will attack people and kill them. Like it's not uncommon that people will fail in their dreams. It's not uncommon that people won't achieve their vision. But the people's reality doesn't have to be your reality. The fact that it happened to them does not mean it has to happen to you. It is deja vu for them. It doesn't have to be deja vu for you. That's what you have to understand. So don't say because it happened to other people. I know it. No, that's not your own portion. You cannot allow that to be your portion. And so it says, I know it. Why do you know it? The one thing also you can look at this is that it, when we have challenges, we can be so confused that rationality doesn't, is not what we have. Why do I say that? He should have said, wait a minute, where did you find this tonic? Where is bones? Where is his dead body? Where did you find this? But this happens to you and me, that when we find our challenges and we're troubled on every side, we don't think clearly again. We don't think rationally again. There are things God expects us to use wisdom for. That's why he gave you a brain. He said he has devoured it. And then he went on to say, without doubt, Joseph is torn into pieces. The word Joseph, everybody say Joseph. Please say Joseph one more time. Joseph means dreams here. Yeah, I mean with this. So what he's saying is that my future is torn into pieces. My dreams is torn into pieces. My vision is torn into pieces. How many people say this all the time when they have a setback? What you saw is an apparition. It will disappear. You can't be weeping over what is temporal. Never take a permanent decision because of a temporary situation. This man took a permanent decision because of a temporary situation. Listen to this. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want <laughs> I can preach on this. Because many times people believe it's over, but it's not over until God says it's over. Yeah. Men do not decide when it's going to be over because men in their best are still men. The destiny is not in any man's hand. The destiny is not in the, in the hand of any group of people. Your destiny is in God. What God has shown you, he has the ability to bring it to pass. How many people are sitting here today who are thinking that their vision and their dreams have been torn into pieces? Everybody says say, torn into pieces. He's saying <laughs> that it's not mendable again. I cannot pick up the pieces again. It's the way you see it. Doesn't mean that's the way God sees it. He says, this is irredeemable. What has happened? I irreparable. No one can put this three together again. It's like Auntie Dumpty that fell over the wall. Can never be put together again. What is not possible with men is possible with God. With God, nothing shall be possible. He said, without a doubt, this thing is torn into pieces. No one can put it together again. <laughs> when we tell people we have never seen this before, it's a lie. We are just using it to scare people. There is nothing that is new under heaven that eyes have not seen before. Never join them to say that it cannot be repairable. They say this is without doubt torn into pieces. No one can do anything about this. It's a setback. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the totality of the story. I've said it several times. When, you, know, you know, when you go for movies here, it's a little bit different. When we were growing up, the movies we used to have, we used to have what they call intermission. Intermission. We used to go to a place called Scala and Odeon, where I grew up. The, the, the fact you do not decide the movie by intermission. And those of us, I mean, everybody watches James Bond. No matter the setback of James Bond, he will come back out of it. Because he's the star of the movie. The star of the movie doesn't die in his movie. You are the star of your movie. You will not die in your movie. No matter the setback, no matter what it is, at times they tie him, they tie him up, they gag his mouth, but he's got to always come out of it. 
That's why he's the star. That's why he's the star of the movie. 007 doesn't die in his movie. Let's look at it. Yeah, I told you, I do. this is a whole sermon. I don't want to go there. You're the one push me there. Let's go on, verse 34. Let's go on. It's a, it's a lot there. Because a lot of the times, we make conclusion on nothing. We make a conclusion. On, look at how he made a permanent decision. Jacob tore his clothes. He put on sackcloths. Sackcloths for money. And he mourned his son many days. Oh my God. He was mourning what was still alive. <laughs> alive and well. That's what he was mourning. He was mourning what was alive. How many times does this happen to us? He was crying over a spilled meat that is, can be gathered together again. With man, we can't gather spilled meat. With God, nothing shall be impossible. He spilled for you. He didn't spill for heaven. Let me tell you this. It is the spiritual that will always overcome the canal. No matter what, the spiritual will always overcome the canal. He tore his clothes, put on and he mourned many days. Go on. Listen to what he said. And his sons and daughters, they came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in morning I will go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Oh God. He says, I'm going to go to my grave because the situation is irreparable. I'm going to go down to my grave because nothing can be done about this. I'm going to my grave. He lived the rest of his life until he found out that Joseph was alive in mystery. Don't live your life in mystery. It's a temporary thing. If God has shown you dreams and vision, he will bring it to pass. He will bring it to pass. God is not a man that he will lie. Has he said it? He will do it. Go on. Meanwhile, everybody say meanwhile. meanwhile. Please say meanwhile. meanwhile. The Midianites sold Joseph to no other house in Egypt but the house of Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. <laughs> like this one again is a whole sermon, I'm telling you. Everybody say meanwhile. meanwhile. Please say meanwhile. meanwhile. Meanwhile, God was working it out. What he was belly aching, staying awake all night. What he was angry and frustrated about. What he was weeping about. Meanwhile, the Bible says God was working it out. God was working behind the scene. We are eyes of men cannot see it. But we are heavens and his hand was making sure that the only people who will come and buy him were the Midianites. And the Midianites were the only people who were going to go to Egypt to sell him. Listen to me, there was no king in the land of Canaan. And if he had to be the prime minister, and if he had to be the king, he has to be in the place where there is a king, and where king can be able to put him in the position of a prime minister. So that they, oh my God. So that what God has shown him will come to pass. God made the economy of Egypt to collapse so that one man can enter into his destiny. So that one man's dreams and one man's vision can come to pass. The whole economy was in jeopardy. So that he will be able to do one thing. To be able to interpret the dream. And so what God has said and has shown him will come to pass. I say to you today that I do not know what the dream is. I do not know what the vision is. I don't know the stage where you are. I don't know the challenges you have faced. But one thing is guaranteed. If God has said it, it will come to pass. If he has shown it, it will come to pass. I don't know. Who I'm speaking to. Because a whole lot of time, everybody say meanwhile. 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 I don't know what this meanwhile means to you. I know what it means to me. So the present challenge is meanwhile. God is working it out. Meanwhile, God is sorting it out. It doesn't look like it's going to work, but meanwhile, God is working it out. He's working it out. They sold him to the house of Potiphar. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it because this is part two of it. Because if not for Potiphar, he will not be in the same jail 
Because that jail is not a common jail. It is only a special jail for people who are high-ranking people. High-ranking people who are the only people who could send their prisoners to that jail. They would never have met the baker or the butler in that jail. The handiwork of meanwhile. The men plotted, but meanwhile, God had his own plan. They plotted, but meanwhile, there are times, you know, they, you know they, they are, they, there are so many P's. P, P, the, the alphabet P in the life of Joseph. Pete, Pharaoh, Pallas, uh, eh? Potiphar. He has so many P's that was following him. <laughs> but the fact that the P's were following him, they took him to his final dimension. There are some things that might be following you that looks negative today, but God will reverse it. Meanwhile, God is working it out. I said, God is just working it out. Meanwhile, God is working it out. You are in a pit. It looks like a, a, a lonely place, but that pit will still change to palace one day. It looks bad now, but there will be a reversal of the role in the mighty name of Jesus. Meanwhile, God is working it out. I do not know who I've come to speak to today, but one thing I can tell you, meanwhile, God is working behind the scene for you. The host of heaven are on assignment making sure that the vision God has given to you will come to pass. I said they will come to pass. I said they will come to pass. They will come to pass. I'm out of time. I'm not out of sermon. Let's bow down our heads. <laughs> Meanwhile, God will continue to work it out for you. That's your portion. That's what God has for you. He will work it out for you. They can plan, they can gather, they can say whatever, but meanwhile, God is working it out. Meanwhile, what are you crying over? What are you staying awake for? What's the challenge that you feel that you can't handle? Meanwhile, God is working it out. Unless he has not shown you, if he has shown you, he will make sure that it comes to pass. Meanwhile, is working it out. Father, Lord, we thank you. This words, Heavenly Father, let it be life unto those who will hear it. Let's go back to believing in you that whatever you have said you will do, you will do it. You say you will never forsake us. You will never forget us. Lord, we know that everyone who is here who has suffered a setback, it is not the end of their lives. The whole story is that they are the actors in their movie. And Lord, they will see the end of it gloriously in the mighty name of Jesus. I do not know whether you are here today. You have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to pray with you. I did this some years ago. If you are here today, you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You want to say, 